Okay. All right, everyone. I'd like to uh, welcome you to another class, another Zoom class from uh, the Lighthouse Tour Project. Baruch Hashem, we've been able to keep the tour going uh, online, even though that physically we couldn't be in the actual space the way that we do it on a regular basis. Uh, tonight's class is part of a new series called Mashiach 101. A nice uh, entry level uh, class to understanding what is it that's happening around us and what is actually uh, our job and what is our call to action, what we need to do. Uh, tonight's class is called Teshuva Emuna Achdut Repeat. And it's a very interesting class. It's something that uh, you should definitely listen to maybe once or twice just to understand what's going on over here and what you need to do some very good basic formulas to getting started. And Baruch Hashem, this is something that will help us in the upcoming days, months, and years as uh, we are starting now the, the, the times of Mashiach. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to give an honorable mention. And do an Elu Nishmat. This lesson will be to the uh, spiritual ascension of the Neshama of David ben Zohara, Yaniv ben Rinam. Moshe Levi ben Shoshana, Shmuel ben Amuma, Tzion ben Zechariah, Rabbi Azariah Labaton, Saya Ita bat Shmuel, and Abraham ben Moshe ben Freddy. Also, that this should be the Fuah Shalom of Esther bat Vishna, and for the Hatzlacha of Esther, Stacy Esther bat Miriam, Guy ben Dina, Michael Citron, and also for the Zivuk of Inbar bat Jacqueline, bat Chem bat Jacqueline, and Yehuda Lev ben Mendel. All right, and may this class also be to that Hatzlacha, to all of you that are tuned in right now on Zoom and tuned in in Facebook Live. And give you a tremendous amount of refuah, briut, hatzlacha, simchat chayim, and they should be successful in all you do. And also, I'd get, like to give a special shout out to uh, last week's uh, honorable mention, which was Henshi Gordetsky. And give you all your heart's desire to you and your family. Amen. Let's get started. Last week's class, we lifted the fog over the current situations in the world. Many people are concerned about the upcoming pangs of the Messianic era, otherwise known in Hebrew as Chavle Mashiach. And as we become more aware of the global changes and the telltale signs of Ikveta de Mashiach, uh, we are coming, we are becoming more in tuned to several storylines, plots, subplots unfolding around the world. I mean, every single day, well, Hashem, if you take a look right now, the truth is starting to come out. I mean, I don't know how good this truth is, but it, there's definitely a new truth coming out. And the old lies are starting to fall apart. And as we see these plots and subplots unfolding around the world, and we see that the real reason of this pandemic that's got us quarantined at home is not necessarily a bat from a Wuhan market, uh, from a street market in China, but maybe something more sinister, uh, way more calculated, and all about uh, this new thing that everybody concerned with, with the 5G antennas, and that's uh, that are planned to carpet the globe in the next few years. All the talk about secret world organizations planning to make a big push in the upcoming few months or years for global domination and global control. And these are select group of figures, powerful figures in the world that plan to take over the masses. I mean, uh, Illuminati, Cabal, New World Order, 
the truth is we know it is about to fall apart, like a deck of cards. And a new reality is dawning upon us. And we will need to be mentally strong to go through all these major changes and doubly spiritually strong to stay focused on the Geula that is upon us. And our main concern of that time is to merit the Geula, to merit the redemption. Now the Yetzira also knows that the end is coming and he makes, he's making a big push. He's going all in and we're going to be living it out, firsthand experiencing as the story unfolds. And it's a very, very unique time. Rashbi Rabbi Shimon Ba Yochai, who's his Hilula is coming up tomorrow, said in the Zohar, Oy le mishis damen bezman Mashiach. Woe to him, the person who's going to be alive during the time of Mashiach. And he also said, Ashrech helko le mishis damen bezman Mashiach. Blessed is he, or lucky is the man who is going to be uh, able to merit to be alive during the times of Mashiach. You know, it's, it's, it's going to be a very, very special time. It's going to be very challenging for some, and it's going to be a, a, a blissful experience for others. There's much more, there is much more to reveal about this time that we're in and about the times that are upon us. I urge everyone to do their own research. Educate yourself about the lies and deceit of the world we live in and the group of people that are looking to take over. As the Maharal said, something that I'd like to share with you, the Maharal from Prague, hundreds and hundreds of years ago said, about this time that we're in, he says, And if a person during these trying times is not going to prepare himself before this trial, who guarantees him that he's going to be able to survive or is going to collapse in this challenge? Because our prophets already prophesied and they told us that the, the, our prophets said meaning the saying that there's going to be a time when Mashiach is coming we're always praying, when is Mashiach coming? When is it going to come? When is it going to come? When, we get, when is it going to be the time of Mashiach? But we don't want to be alive during that generation. We want Mashiach to come, but we don't want to be alive in that generation. Why? There's going to be such difficult challenges during that time. It's going to be so difficult to live in the time of Mashiach, to be a Jew in the time of Mashiach, as, as the Maharal explains. Furthermore, he says, Now we know that we always have the power to withstand these trials. Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu mevin isayon le'adam, ela em ken yichon amod bo. Hashem never gives a person a challenge that he can't withstand. Or something that he can't uh, pass. Uh, however, the rabbi is telling us that you have to prepare yourself for it. Even though that these challenges are coming, you can't just let them come as they, uh, you know, and just wing it. You have to prepare yourself for these challenges. And we're all thinking, you know, a lot of people are worried. You know, Mashiach is coming. Great. We're always praying. We're always singing. Mashiach, Mashiach, Mashiach. Now that the time for Mashiach is here, a lot of people are quaking in their boots. A lot of people are really, really worried if they're going to be able to withstand the trials of the Messianic era. So the rabbi gives us advice. The Maharal says, We have to prepare. And not only do we have to prepare, but we have to worry about what's up, uh, coming up. And says, and by preparing and being cautious, Vadai, surely, will easily succeed. How? Hashem will help us. We'll have heavenly uh, help. Because we are very, very close to the redemption of God. And furthermore, he says, and keep in mind, this is a rabbi from hundreds and hundreds of years ago, not talking about, uh, you know, nowadays, where surely way more prophecies have come true. But he says, All the signs that were given to us by our great sages of the Talmud, 
כבר נתקיימו בנו בכפליים. They already came up true several times, double over. ולא נשאר לנו אלא להמתין ולצפות רגע רגע לגאולה. He says the only thing that's left for us that at any given moment, at any moment, we're going to be redeemed. במהרה באמנו אמן. So we see that the rabbi is telling us that the geula is upon us and we have to prepare and it's going to be a challenge. Now, many people after last week's class contact me personally asking, what do we do? Is there hope? I'm scared. Literally, people reached out to me and they're just scared that they hope that they'll be able to sleep, go to sleep after a Uh, last week's class because it was so eye-opening or some of the new classes that some of the rabbis are putting out there that are really eye-opening you know anybody who's really interested in what's really going on and not having your head in the sand and you're really interested on you know how to merit how to win the redemption how to win the geula and you're listening to these classes uh, shake you up even myself even to uh, you know uh, uh to reveal some of these things to my wife you have to do it suavely you have to you know ease them into it these are not easy concepts to That you just drop on somebody these are going to be very trying times and we have to be very real with ourselves of the cur- of the current situation and of the upcoming cha- uh, changes however you should know that as Jews the storyline of everything that's happening on the planet is going to be directly pointed to us it's going to pertain to us the goyim at the end of the day the Gentiles at the end of the day will blame us for They'll target us. They'll attack us. Everything will be very strongly affected anywhere that we are in the world with the time of Mashiach. Meaning not necessarily just what's happening with us internally as Jews, our connection with God, our Teshuvah, our Echdud, our, our Emunah, but the world itself is going to have an issue with us. And we're going to be very much targeted during that time. And along this journey that we're about to enter, or that we've started already, as many people have uh, already uh, put a stamp on it, that COVID-19 was the start of the big shift into a new reality. So along this journey, everyone must come to a reset point, both in their regular lives and in their spiritual lives. Everybody has to come to this point. Which point? There, every single Jew has to go into their default setting, or if they don't do it on their own, eventually something in the upcoming future, and some of these events that are going to unfold, are going to bring everybody to the point of realization that we have no one that we can rely on except for our Heavenly Father in the heavens. No one will be able to protect us. We will deep down inside our hearts feel that nobody can save us. Not our bank accounts, not our lawyers, not our doctors, not our uh, mayors, not our presidents, not our army. Nothing, nothing will save you. You will go to get to the point and you're going to say, Hashem, only you can help me. And when you get to that point, you get to that state of mind, when each major... And that along the way, all these different things are going to unfold. You're going to get to a breaking point. Now, each person is going to get to a different breaking point on their own. There's going to be major life-changing events unfolding. And a new group of people will enter that reality. And a new group of people will enter that reality. Meaning every time something major happens, we're going to scoop up another group of Jews that I got to the point. that's it I give up I get I you know what's going on in the world the world has gone crazy who can help us only God and when they enter that reality that state of mind and that breaking point and they scream out from the depths of their hearts Abba help me God save me no one can help us now only you at that point you're officially ready for Mashiach At that point, you've reached that, uh, that, the, the starting point of your readiness to be in the times of Mashiach. But that's just the beginning. That's just the start. Because the real work to meriting the Gula actually is 
after you reach that point is a three-step process. It's actually four. That, but you have to go through this three-step process in order to really, really be ready for redemption. Just like the Maharal said. For you to come out of this time in history, in order for you to advance to the next stage on this planet, into the days of Mashiach, you must go through certain processes. If you got to that point where, great, it's a start. At least you understand that nobody can help you, only God. And you should know that the whole world is going to come to that understanding. And the whole world is going to come to that. It's just different events will scoop up new groups of people that eventually will all come to that mindset. Finally, all people will turn to God. Most people, back in the days, people turned to God for praise, for glory, for, for exalting Him. Nowadays, it's going to be that people are going to turn to Him because they can't, they can't figure it out on their own. They said the world has gone crazy. Only you can save us from what's going on. And during the days of Mashiach, the times that we're in right now, you will need to go through this process. Step one is teshuva, repentance. Step two is going to be emunah, faith, belief. Step three is going to be achdut, which is unity. And step four, repeat. Now, tonight, we're actually going to give the actual formulas to each one of those steps. Each part of what needs to happen during the time of Mashiach, you're going to get the how-to in this class tonight. And as you complete each process and you get to advance uh, in your journey, you get to eventually merit Mashiach because you prepared yourself for it. It's going to be very hard to just wing the times of Mashiach if you don't have Teshuvah under your belt, if you don't have Emunah under your belt, and if you don't have Ahdut on your belt, and if you're not really good at it too. Furthermore, not just meriting Mashiach uh, by yourself. We know that, uh, you know, we are ma'aminim b'nei ma'aminim. We are the, the believers, the sons of believers. And you know that we have parents and grandparents and great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents that passed away. And Baruch Hashem, all I'm saying, we're all tzaddikim. But for those of you who didn't come from such homes that everybody was a, a righteous Jew and they weren't on the on the path and you're worried like are they going to come are they going to be part of the resurrection are they going to be part of the geula maybe the part of the journey not just for you personally to merit the the uh the geula but helping the people that are around you your immediate circle your friends your family or even the deceased that your person that your performance can actually pull them out of the spiritual failures that they're suffering from in their afterlife and have them merit the Geulah as well. As you know, we learned the previous years in our classes about the Shuvah in the month of Elul, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Masadim et Shuvah, the Rosh Hashanah, the book of the living and the, de uh, the deceased opens up. Sefer uh, HaChaim is opened up and we, you know that we should be inscribed the Sefer HaChaim Tovim, that we should be inscribed in the Sefer HaChaim which means what? That, you know, you want to have a good life. So, you, you know, who's written for life and who's written for death? That's for the people that are here. But they say that Hashem Baruch Hu also opens up this, the, the books of the dead, of the people that are, that are already passed on. And why is that? Because he always looks back to see, what did you leave behind? Whoa, well, let me see your handiwork. Let me see what, what your offspring is up to. Let me see what your children are doing. And he looks down and he says, wow, your child really, really moved up in his, uh, in his spiritual performance, in his religiosity. And not only that, look at this, he's able to actually uh, be a, a, a mashpia, an influencer to the people around him. And look how many more people are keeping Shabbat, how many more people are uh, learning Torah, look how many more people are keeping mitzvot because of him or her. And all of a sudden, the guy who was maybe on the seventh level of hell, or maybe on the first level of heaven, gets an upgrade. Puck. And he goes up, and he goes up, and he goes up, and who knows if he didn't even merit to the Geula, to the resurrection, but the offspring, the ones that he left behind, are able to bring him up. So the work that you have is not only for yourself, but it's for the people that are around you, for your friends, for your family, and even for the deceased. 
Now, some people already hit their breaking point with this pandemic. Some people, and la no really shine, they're already COVID-19 already got them. They they're broken already. They're at home for already two months with their wife. Some people are coming out of quarantine, going straight into divorce court. Some people already had a breakdown from their children, from their finances, from their lack of freedom. They already began screaming out to Hashem, help me, only you can save me. Some of them are ready for this lesson now. They're primed for it. Others will need to keep it as their favorites. Maybe you need to save it. Maybe in a month from now, two months from now, three months from now, six months from now, a year from now, when you have that breaking point, maybe you need to play, uh, press play on this class again. The rabbis tell us that the final geula will be like the first geula. The first geula happened in Egypt, in Mitzrayim. The Jews were supposed to be there for 400 years. They left after 210 because they were overworked. Avodat parech. But also, there was something very unique about the Jews cry to Hashem for help. The Pesukim go, like, uh, go as such. It says that the Jewish people had two different ways of yelling out, screaming out, or praying to God. First Pesuk, He says, Hashem says, I saw my poor nation that is in Egypt. Ve'et tsa'akatam. The tsa'aka in Hebrew literally translates to a yell. But here it means tsa'aka is a special type of, of prayer. When you just scream out to God, help me. That's a tsa'aka. And, who, and that he heard their yelling, their, 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 their prayer slash yell that was from their uh, noksav, the, 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 tor the tormentors in Egypt. Because I can feel, I, I understand their pain. So here over here, we're introduced to a word called tsa'aka, tsa'akatam. It's a special prayer that's with a scream. And it has a lot of power, that type of prayer. Then the second pasuk says, Vaishma Elohim et na'akatam. Hashem heard their na'akatam. Na'akatam in Hebrew also means prayer, but it's something else. And I'll explain it in a second. It says, Vaishko Elohim et berito. And Hashem remembered his covenant. Et Avraham et Tzach et Yaakov. He remembered what he promised Avraham. What well, he promised Yitzhak, he promised Yaakov. But what made Hashem remember the forefathers? What made Hashem remember Avraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov that allowed us to, to, to reduce the sentence from 400 years to 210? Na'akatam. Na'akatam. Na'aka is a different type of prayer. This is when you don't have any more words. Where your mind is not working. When you can't form thoughts or ideas or, or have some sort of a reasoning or even form sentences, rather nakata means it's like a, a primal scream, a yell that comes from the depths of your soul, meaning it's not even words, it's just like ah you know when you just like from the from the inside of your soul, you're just yelling to Hashem. It's considered a prayer. And it says that the, that the Jews got redeemed from Egypt. Because of tzakatam and na'akatam, those two types of prayers, the yelling and the screaming from torment and running out of words, no more words from the pain that they're going through. And that shook up the heavens and woke up Hashem's heart and mind and remembered Avram Yitzhak Yaakov in order to redeem them. So when we say that the, the final geula is going to be like the first geula, we were go we're going to get to that point as well. Each person eventually will get to that point. Hazal tell, told, tell us that because everything that happened then will happen now. The same way that they got to that type of breaking point in their life, we will too. Different events will scoop up different people. Now, once you reach that point, like we said, you're ready for Mashiach. As David Amelech wrote, in Tehillim, on the 51st uh, Perek, on the 19th Pasuk, he says, Zivche Elohim, the, if you want to bring an offering to God, Ruach Nishbara, a broken spirit, Lev Nishbar, a broken heart, Venitke, someone who's really 
depressed and heartbroken, Elohim lo Hashem is not going to turn him down. He's going to listen to that one. In other words, I'm just trying to really crystallize the point that we have to get to a point in our regular lives and in our spiritual lives where we are broken to the point that we are genuine and real with Hashem and needing Him. And needing Him. Needing His help. No one can help us, only you. And once you get to that point, then you can begin the process. The three-step process to winning the Geula. We'll start off with step number one. Step number one is Teshuvah. <clears throat> Keep in mind that Teshuvah is a dual pathway. You can do Teshuvah Behava or you can do Teshuvah Beira. What is the difference? Doing repentance out of love or repentance out of fear. Hazal tell us anyone who does repentance out of love for Kadosh Baruch Hu, if he had a million sins, they get flipped into a million merits. In other words, you're in debt for a million, now you have a million in the bank. That's when you do Teshuvah Ma'ava. If you do Teshuvah Mira, which seems like in the times of Mashiach, a lot of people might tap into that pathway because out of fear, things are going to scare you into, uh, uh, into wanting Hashem to help you. It is what it is. got to call it for what it is. If you're able to come back to Hashem out of love, gravy, amazing. But if it's going to take something that's going to scare you into it, that's, we, we got a plan for that too. And that plan is called Teshuvah Mira. Teshuvah Mira means if you had a million sins, you do Teshuvah, they get wiped out, clean slate, you're back to zero, start fresh. So that in, that in itself is an introduction, is an amazing concept. That one, Teshuvah Be'ahava takes your sins and turns them into merits. Teshuvah Mira wipes the slate clean and you start fresh. Now, anyone who's took any of our Teshuvah classes with us, uh, you know, in the times of Elul, Rosh Hashanah, Kippur, we really, really have a lot of classes cataloged on YouTube, on Facebook, with the Lighthouse, or Kiruvim Sharon on, on, on YouTube, on SoundCloud. I mean, if you really, really want to delve into and dissect your Teshuvah process, just go into all those classes. They are 100% relevant right now, even though it's not Elul. Even though it's not Rosh Hashanah, it's 100% relevant because everything that is said in those classes will help you go through this. We'll have to go through this step one of Teshuvah. However, just to give you a quick formula, because like we promised, we we're going to give you three formulas over here. Very easy to, to, to grab onto these concepts, to hit the ground running with, uh, with this lesson, is that the formula for Teshuvah is A plus B equals C. In the Pasuk, it's Mode Ve'ozev Yerucham. Teshuvah is a three-stepper. Mode, you admit what you did wrong. Ve'ozev, you leave it behind. You are no longer going to do that sin again. You're forging a new way, a new you, and that activates Yerucham. Hashem will give you mercy, forgiveness. He will pass over you. He will, he will, he will forgive you. He'll have mercy on you. So again, that's the Teshuvah formula. Admit the sin. Leave it behind to never go, to it, go back to it again. Because should you go back into it, then your Teshuvah process gets a little, you know, tied right back again and brings back everything that you let go. Yerucham, you activate the mercy of God. So what do you do? So you sit yourself down. You do some soul searching. You do some spiritual auditing of your service of Hashem. How have you been? How much time of your life have you been giving to God, to Torah, to your religion? You know, this is something that I recommend and I try to do almost every year right before Rosh Hashanah. Take a piece of paper. Pros, cons, plus, minus. And I list all the amazing things that I did. All the amazing things that I did through Torah, Mitzvot, and Masim Tovim. I want to judge myself. But I'm also very, very honest with myself on how I sinned that year. 
and I write down all the cons, all the, the minus, all the negative things that I've done. And I, what I like to do is I like to fold a page in half. I tap myself on the shoulder for job well done on that positive column. And then I sit down and I start knocking down all the negatives one by one. I start dealing with it. I start dealing with my negative spiritual performance of the past year and possibly of your entire life. If you've never done it before, then it's going to take you some time. You know, anybody who goes through that spiritual exercise every month of Elul, every holiday, uh, every year, it's free. You come to Yom Kippur, you put in the work. You know, Yom Kippur has a meeting. The day of, uh, you know, the day that you're forgiven. And then on Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, you walk out of there, you're free. Hashem forgave, forgave me. I did the proper teshuvah. I went through the proper teshuvah process. However, if you didn't do that, then you know, you're still carrying that baggage with you. And if you haven't done it this year or two years or three years or your entire life, then you got to sit with yourself. That's what Hashem is expecting from us in the teshuvah process. And start snipping away. You're leaving your old self behind one by one. I don't eat kosher. Snip it. That was the old me. From now on, I eat only kosher. I don't keep Shabbat. Snip it away. That's the old me. Now I keep Shabbat. And so on and so forth. Inquire a new identity. That Jew that you were and that was completely off the derech, that's the old you. And the new Jew, the one that is now post Teshuvah, after you've decided to take upon yourself a new path, that's the new version of you. And the whole idea is to modem, to sit down and to admit it. Ozev, you leave it behind. I'm not coming back. It's behind me. Yerucham, you have a brand new page. You're, 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 you're a baby boy. You're a baby girl. You just started your life all over again. Hashem gives you a brand new page. The beauty of Teshuvah. Or furthermore, take your phone and go down your phone contacts and examine. Examine your relationship with each one of those people that's in your phone. Start to look up all your damaged relationships, your broken ties, your divorced friendships, and begin the teshuvah process with each one. I mean, the, you know, the teshuvah is always also a dual pathway. It's teshuvah with you and Hashem and God and the Torah and all the mitzvot that you've performed or not performed. And of course, importantly, and even more importantly, the rabbis tell us, is your relationship with other people, and with Jews in particular. And you start all these broken relationships, broken ties, these broken friendships, these damaged relationships, and you start the teshuvah process with each one. And once you've cleared up your spiritual baggage with Hashem, and mended your relationship with His children, because you have to imagine that Hashem has kids. Beni Bechori, Am Yisrael, we are His children. You can't have an amazing relationship with, his, with, with the father, where you are cursing his child, hitting his child, disrespecting his child. There's no, there's no father in the world that will have a relationship with any person if he knows that he's disrespecting his children. Similarly is Hashem. If you, you can have the most amazing relationship in your mind with God, but if you don't have a good relationship with his children, he's not going to pay attention to you. First, ben adam le chaviro, then ben adam le makom. Now that you've gone into this, you're putting in the work and you're doing your teshuvah process with yourself, with God, and with people, you're officially starting on a new page. It's either teshuvah mi'ah and it's a clean slate or teshuvah mi'ava and you're ready now. You're winning. You're ahead of the game. But you're a newborn. You're a newborn. You have a new lease on life. And after a genuine teshuvah process, you can begin to almost keep track of your mitzvot. You can count how many mitzvot you did during the day. Or God forbid, how many sins. Because it's the new you. You could actually almost like, you know, like a, you know how people catch uh, butterflies with a net? You can almost like at the end of the day, just catch your sins that you caught for the day. Oh my God, I, I, I ate without a bracha. Oh my God, I forgot to pray. Oh my God, I made some sort of sin. It's, you can almost count the sins on your hand and do teshuvah process on them that day, and it's over. It's like so freeing, the teshuvah process. It's so liberating, especially when you've gone to, you put in the work, and you're now, uh, you know, past the teshuvah with Hashem and with people, and now you can actually just 
concentrate on your performance of the mitzvot, it's actually incredible because you can really concentrate on your performance and you can really, you know, monitor yourself how many mitzvot you did, how many sins you did, and you can do your teshuvah instantly, immediately, no buildup. Not of the day, not of the week, not of the month, or not of the years. You're able to make quick teshuvah of that one or two sins a day or keep track of your midot. And once this part is over, once this teshuvah part is over, you'll experience that something shifted in your soul. That you feel clean. You feel that you're focused. You feel that you're connected. And at this point, you probably have had tons of conversations with God. And this relationship building exercise with Hashem called Teshuvah brought you to a place that is very, very hard to achieve nowadays. Because once you go through this process of Teshuvah and you take yourself into the spiritual, like becoming like a spiritual audit of yourself, and you've already cleared up all these skeletons in the closets with people, with God, and with yourself, you're now almost graduating to a new level. And that, that new level is a level of understanding, le level of feeling the religion and feeling the creator. And over there enters a new level called emuna, Because emuna is a state of mind. It's an understanding. It's a, it's a life tool like no other. Should you acquire, should you acquire emuna in your life, you can probably deal with anything, anything that life can dish out. Because emuna means that you've reached an understanding that anything that happens to you in your life is for your own good and is for your own benefit. Hakol letova. It's all for the best. Every single thing that Hashem puts in your life, all the struggles, all the hardships, all the failures, all the successes, all the triumphs are all custom made for you and are designed in order, designed for your life journey in order for you to fulfill your ultimate tikkun. That's emuna. That's when you are able to accept everything that Hashem has put in on your plate. And when you understand that your soul's journey in this world and the successes, failures, or trials, these are all custom-made moments in order for you to merit the maximum share in the world to come. Everything that Hashem has in store for you is so that the Shama, once it leaves this world, can get the maximum reward in the next world, in Olam Abba. In other words, Hashem is not so much concerned with you here. He'll do certain things to, uh, to your neshama, to your life experience, that in this world will seem difficult, challenging, hard. But in reality, later on, when you leave Olam HaSheker and go to Olam HaEmet, over there you'll see that it was the best thing for you because all these challenges were designed in order to give you the maximum olam haba. And that involves things that are understood and are connected to your uh, present life experience, but also involves recycled events from previous lifetimes that are now part of this life experience. And you still have to deal with that. You still have to be dealt with, still have to be repaired, still have to be resolved. And most of the times they're random, random people, random series of events, and it doesn't even make sense. And naturally you want to complain and say, why? I don't understand. How could this happen? Why is it happening to me? But having emuna is realizing that there's no mistakes, that everything is custom made. Certain things are going to understand why they're challenging in your life. Because of your wife, because of your children, because of your work, because of finance, because of health. Oh, okay, that makes sense. But the things that don't make sense, and they're possibly recycled events from previous lives that you still didn't repair, because we have uh, we have certain things that we didn't complete in previous lifetimes, so we still they're still on our plate and we're dealing with it. And you say to Hashem, you know what? 
I have emuna. I don't understand it. I don't understand it. But I have emuna. It's all for the best. You know why? Because Hakadosh Baruch Hu told him that God is good, and everything that He does is for the best. Everything is for the. It's all for the good. In Masechet Brachot, in the Gemara, it says, "Chayav Adam levarich al ra'ah k'shem shum varich al tova." A person must bless on the good, like he blesses. I'm sorry, must bless on the bad, the same way that he blesses on the good. Just like we say, "Baruch atah Hashem elokim echalam atovu metiv." When something good happens to us, "Oh, Hakadosh Baruch Hu atovu metiv." You're good, and everything that you do is good. Same thing we say, "Baruch atah Hashem da'ena emet." What's da'ena emet? It's challenging. I don't understand it, but you are the true and just God. Whatever you have in store for me, I accept it. And we say that when a person passes away, because when a person passes away, a lot of people say, "Why? How could it be? How could you do this? How could you take him away from us?" But a Jew that says, as soon as he hear about somebody's passing, "Baruch Dayana Emet." You accept it so easily? You act you accept it so quickly? Yeah, of course. Hashem doesn't make any mistakes. The guy's journey is over. His mission in life is over. This was the, exactly the perfect time for him to go away. I have no questions. On, I have no qualms with God's decision. Oh, this guy is living the emunah life. He has emunah. When you're able to accept everything, every challenge that Hashem is going to put in front of your face, every card that you're going to be dealt, regardless of what it is, regardless of the challenge, if it's, it's good, it's easy, successful, or hard, or challenging, and you and, and it's going to take a lot of your energy to cope with, and you deal with it, and you accept it, you accept your life, you accept what Hashem is in the store for you, you've achieved emunah. You are living the life of emunah. Having that mindset takes time. It takes practice. Life needs to unfold. Challenges need to come up. And you need to put this belief, this faith into action. It's not so easy. I'm telling you from experience, it's not so easy. Having emuna is that in that moment when there's the challenge to actually say and believe, it's all for the best. It doesn't make sense to me. My mind, my eyes, my ears, my human brain make me not, I, it's difficult for me to understand it. I can't comprehend it. But what I do know is that Hashem does not make mistakes. I know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Hu Tov Metiv, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Lo Mevira La'olam, Hashem, there's no such thing as bad in this world. And that right now I can't see it, but later on, later on, maybe in a year from now, maybe a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, 10 years from now, or maybe in the next world, no lama ba, I'll see, that it was all for the best. I have emuna that is all for the best. Once you have that as a life tool, there's almost nothing that can ruin your day. There's nothing, I mean, the days will be tough, but you'll know how to deal with it. You'll take it on the chin, but you'll survive, you'll stand. You're not going to get knocked out. That's emuna. So life needs to give you all these challenges and you have to pass. You have to activate your emuna. And once you've done it once, twice, three times, four times, five times, 10 times, 20 times, you're living an emuna life. But if you have not lived a life of emuna, it's going to be challenging. It takes time. Retraining your mind retraining your reactions, retraining that second nature that you've been accustomed to your entire life. You've been programmed your entire life to be, I mean, you have to actually, I'm sorry, reprogram yourself from the program that you gave yourself to entire life to be okay with all that Hashem is in store for you for that day, for that week, for that month, for that year, for the life. For my, I'm totally okay with what Hashem is in store for me. That's emuna. No questions asked. It's all for the best. I'll give you a couple of real extreme emuna stories uh, to put you into the perspective of what it is. Obviously, these are not regular people that I'm going to describe right now, but this might give you an idea. I, I've, I've repeated this, these stories a couple of times in my other classes, but I love them. Because it's, you know, these are real Jews that uh, I'm still surprised by their reaction. 
so there was a story of a of a of a kolel in a, a yeshiva in Israel, and this yeshiva used to have a nightly visitor. At eleven o'clock at night, he would come in. He would go into their kitchen. He would eat their food. He would go to the tzedakah box. He would empty out the tzedakah box. He would look around, and then he would run away. And he did this for several times, several times, until finally they were they they were on to him. And they decided that on this particular night when he comes in, they're going to let him come in. They're going to let him eat. They're going to let him take the money out of the tzedakah box. But when he comes out, they're going to put a little cover on top of him. They're going to take him to the alley, and they're going to show him what's what. And wouldn't you know it, that night, they were standing by the alley, and the guy comes in, he eats, he takes the tzedakah, and while the people are waiting for him outside to come out, they grab him, they start taking him to the floor, they're beating him up, and they see something that is very strange. The guy is not making any sounds. The guy is not, is not complaining. When they lift up the, the cover that they, or the sheet that they put on top of him, they realize that they nabbed the wrong guy. That at that time, it wasn't the, the, the homeless guy or the guy that was taking advantage of the call that came out, but it was the Rosh Yeshiva. The Rosh Yeshiva was stayed late on his way out, on the way home. He got covered by his students and he got beat up in the alley. They were so shocked. They were so surprised. They asked the rabbi, Rabbi, why didn't you say stop? Rabbi, why didn't you tell us that it was you? You know what the rabbi says? You think Hashem makes mistakes? I probably deserved it. Who knows what was my tikkun? And who am I to complain on what Hashem has in store for me? Do we have that type of emunah? Do we have that type of mindset? But just goes to show it, tzaddikim, where they're at, that even when things like that are happening to them, they already accept the deen of Hashem. It's a very extreme story. I'll give you another one. There was a, a lady who was in the world of Shiduchim for a very, very long time. And she had a very hard time uh, finding her soulmate. And after... Many, 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 many dates. First dates. Most of them did never went to the second date. Uh, you know, they, 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 the story goes that she went over a hundred dates, if not more, and still she wasn't able to to find her her shiduch. And after a, a long time, she actually did find the young man, and they were able to get married. And after they got married, after all these years and years and years of finding the Shiduch, they finally tried to have children. And they try and they try for years and years and years. Meaning not only has it been years that she took her to find her Shiduch, but years to have children. They finally go to all these specialists. Finally, they went to this one specialist that pinned down the problem. And he let her know part of her organs on the inside are connected to the body. They're supposed to be not connected. And so they're actually completely connected to the skin of her inner body, and not only the inner flesh of her body. And that's what's holding her back from uh, conceiving. And there's nothing that could be done about that. So she was crushed. And as she's coming out of the doctor's office to, to, the, to her husband, who's sitting in the car across the street, she was so distraught. She wasn't paying attention. She was so crushed. That after all this time, that finally after she gets married with all these different tests, that she tried to get uh, pregnant, that she can't have children, that on the way walking to her husband's car, she gets hit by another car. And she flies in the air, 30 feet in the air, and thrown to the ground and broke almost every bone in her body. You could imagine that this lady has been a lot, gone through a lot in her life. And not only did she go through a lot in her life, but it took her some time to come out of rehabilitation. It took about a year till she got out of the cast, another year to two years after she was able to rehabilitate. 
And one day, as she goes to her regular checkups, she gets her different blood work. They ask her to come into the office. And they sit her down and they tell her, we checked your blood the way that we've been doing almost every single visit. And something came up. She says, what came up? This lady has gone through so much. It's going to be very hard to, to, to shock her with something, uh, something new. I said, your blood work came back showing that you're pregnant. Pregnant? She was completely shocked. She says, no, it can't be. She went to the original doctor that told her that she cannot, to the specialist, that she cannot have children. He went, he checked her out and says, yes, you are pregnant. But how could it be? They went, they did the MRI, they did the CT scan, they did all the x-rays, they found out that when she got into that accident, apparently it, uh, it lodged a part of her body that disconnected the, uh, the reproductive organ and she was able to conceive from that accident. And she was so elated. She, uh, she had about two or three children and they came and they asked her, how did you deal with it? How did you deal with the whole shiduch process, with the whole not being able to conceive, the, the, the car accident? You know what she says? It's all for the best. It's exactly what Hashem wanted. And, and not only that, thank God, because if I didn't go through all that, I wouldn't have these beautiful children that I have today. So I ask you, do we have that type of emunah? How many of us would have tapped out after 100 dates? How many people would have tapped out after three or four years of trying to conceive? How many people have tapped out after such a crazy accident, 30 feet in the air? But that woman, a woman, a, a, an Orthodox Jew that lives with emunah, and took it that it's all for the best. It was all for the best. And it's exactly what Hashem wanted. Not saying that we have that type of emunah. But that's an example of it. There are going to be some challenges coming up. The world is going to change as we know it. The metamorphosis that will require all our mental space, all our energies, to cope, to survive, to process the change. There's going to be a lot going on. Emuna is a must. It's a necessary life tool for this next stage in our lives. Because as Jews, this next stage in humanity requires more from us than from them. This next stage that the world is going through requires more from us than the rest of the world. It requires us to go through a new world order, a new world consciousness, alongside the pangs of the Messianic era, Hevle Mashiach, which will require us to be still spiritually connected during these turbulent times. In other words, you turn on the news, the whole world is falling apart, and you still got to have your, your, your Teshuvah in check, you got to have your Emunah in check, you got to have your spiritual performance in check. It's going to take a lot. It's going to take a lot from us in order to succeed in the, in the time of Mashiach or in the Hevle Mashiach. Not only that, to go through all these challenges, accept the challenges and know that, know that it's all for the best. No matter how crazy the world, it will seem at that time. You're going to have to have iron-clad emuna that has been tried and tested and lived out a few battles in order for us to withstand the final war with the Yetzirah and his final attempt, his final attempt at this planet. So we did, so we did Teshuvah, we did Emunah, the third step for this spiritual prescription for the times of Mashiach happens to be the secret of the Jewish people. Happens to be the, the most elusive part of our nation, which is Ahdut, unity. As we all know, we, you know, in previous classes we've mentioned, when we are united, we are protected. We are invincible. We, are, we win. When we are divided, we lose. A beautiful example of that in the times of David Amelech, when he went to war, he lost people. People died 
when David Amelech was uh, leading the nation. Yet Ahav, who was an evil king and lived during the time of idolatry, and the people, Am Yisrael, were idol worshippers, not one person died in death. Not one person died in battle. So the question goes, David Melech versus Ahav, the, the, the good king versus the evil uh, king. One has deaths, the other one has none. And not only that, the people during the time of Ahav were idolaters, uh, idol worshippers, and not one death at war. What's their secret? Hazal tell us, unity. Even though that they were idol worshippers, but they had achdut, and their unity is what saved them. Now, to quickly understand unity and its importance, we have to go just a little bit back to understand the entire concept. Hashem created this world and left it unfinished. It needed a few more spiritual tweaks, tikkunim, as they're called. Uh, the, the Zohar talks about the refach nitzosot, the 200 and, uh, 278 sparks in the breaking of the vessels in the time of creation. It's a very, uh, very famous Kabbalistic concept that in the, in the beginning of time, in creation, just to simplify it, there's uh, over 200 and close to 280 sparks in the world, the 278 to be exact, that need to be picked up, need to be searched out, picked up, and the job of the, the handyman of the people that are supposed to be this, do, doing this tikkunim are the Jewish people. So when Hashem created man, He created him as a co-creator. When it says, let us make a man in our image, in our likeness, is because a man's purpose in this world is to emulate the creator, especially the Jew. Just like Hashem created the world, we're supposed to co-create with the Kadosh Baruch Hu. Just like Hashem created this whole planet that we're in, and, and there was a few more things that left over, He left it for us so we can co-create with Him. The Refak Nitzotzot. I think uh, we just did, actually we described it in detail uh, in the class that we did just last week, Time to Get Godly, of how we emulate the Kadosh Baruch Hu, especially during these times of, uh, of the Omer, the times of the Sefirot, of the counting, and the time between uh, Pesach and, uh, and, uh, and Shavuot, when we do the spiritual refinement and the character refinement in order to emulate God, to, to, to go in His ways, to mimic His ways. However, as humanity has failed in that mission, and only a few have been able to be successful at it, in the end of days, Mashiach will herald in a new era, a new consciousness of, we say it every day, on that day, God will be one, and His name will be one. So, in other words, if you ever want to understand what does that mean, Bayomahu on that day, what's that day? The day of Mashiach. The day that, you know, the Yetzirah gets shechted, Mashiach is here, and a new day has come, a new era has come, especially for the Jews. Bayomahu on that day, Hashem will be one, and His name will be one. Even our children learn in kindergarten, uh, Hashem is here, Hashem is there, Hashem is truly everywhere, right? He's in everything. Hashem is everything and everywhere. Hashem is in nature. Hashem is in the cosmos. Hashem is in the wildlife. Hashem is in humans. Hashem is in spirits. And od milvado. The entire existence is God. There's, no, there's not one thing in this world that is not God. It's all Hashem. So when you look around the world, everything in this world has a godly spark within him. The rock in your driveway, the snail on the grass, that tree, that mountain, that planet, that shooting star, that bird, that lion, that human, that mega star you see on, on TV, and that homeless guy that you see on the street, from that super righteous rabbi to the wickedest villain that's in the news, 
It's all God. It's all one. You know, when I uh, first realized this concept of oneness with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I did a little bit of a mental exercise to make myself understand this oneness of God. Because again, you know, it's like very, you know, Hashem opens up your mind little by little. You know, you got to go through levels, peels, you know, layers and layers and layers. But sometimes you try to understand the oneness of Hashem. You know, if everything is God, then, you know, how do I really feel that? How is everything really one? So I did this mental exercise with myself. I remember if I was living back in New York and I was going through it and I was trying to understand this concept of oneness. So Hashem as a whole is one. He's absolutely perfect. He needs nothing and needs no one to be God and needs no one to be one. He is not lacking or needing anything from anybody. So he's a perfect creation, not even a creation. We don't even know, but our minds can even fathom to even to explain God. But he doesn't need anything from anything or anybody. He is perfect on his own. But in order to experience himself in a billion or a trillion different ways and still be one, he took a tiny piece of himself Let's call that tiny piece the neshama or a little godly particle that's in everything that's in existence. And he put it into the animal, into the person, into the spirit, into the tree, into the plant in order to experience himself in trillions and trillions of different ways, but yet still be one. But there's a twist to it, especially in the, when it comes to humans. There's free will. Free will allowing an endless amount of different possibilities and different life experiences. Yet it's still always God. So when you see uh, people in the supermarket or at the park or at work or at school or at home, it's God going through millions and millions of different vessels, making millions and millions of different choices. And that, that, that godly spark chose on each specific journey. And if you look at it that way, you don't feel divided. You don't feel different because that guy standing in front of you in the supermarket, he's got God in him. That puppy that's in the street, he's got God in him. That, that person that's on the other side of the planet that I don't know, I have no connection to, that's God too. You, that little spark that's inside of you, that's God also. So we're all from the same composition. We're all from the same source. How can you hate on it? How can you be disconnected from it? It's you. So you don't feel divided or, or different. You feel connected and all of the same. So once you begin to realize that, that we're all from the same source, you either feel good or bad when you see that person going through their life experience. You either feel good or bad for that godly experience that they're going through and the choices that they made. For example, that homeless guy on the street, you can you know, ignore him, have nothing to do with him, walk away from him. Or you can have a positive experience and reach out to him and be like, hey, I am you, you are me. How can I help you? You can either continue division or connection. And nowadays, all of humanity has lost the art of connection. Billions and billions of people are connected today, more than any other time in history, but superficially. These are not real connections. These are not genuine connections. We are connected through our electronic devices, but not with our hearts, not with our souls. So we see that the world is in a very strange place. Everyone, everyone feels like they're connected, but they're really not. And yet the entire, uh, the entire uh, meaning or the, the entire uh, the essence of existence is actually to all be one, to all be united, to all be connected. Yet we're very, very far away from that, even though we're more connected than we've ever been ever in history. 
you should know that this thing that I speak of, of being connected, being united, we achieved it. It happened before. The first time that we achieved it was uh, the Jewish nation in Matan Torah, in Har Sinai, in Shavuot. It says that we were there. Am echad echad, one nation, one heart. We were completely united. It's possible. We achieved it. If it was done before, it could be done again. We had Am Echad Belev Echad. And at that, and in that stage of, of, of the Jewish nation's history, we merited to receive the Torah, the greatest gift of all time. We had the truest connection to God ever. And we ever got to the point that of Adam Arishon before the original sin. Could you imagine? Could you imagine what unity gave to us? And unity, we merited through the unity, we merited Torah, we merited to have a, a direct connection to Kadosh Baruch Hu. He actually spoke to us face to face. And actually, we were able to reverse all the sins from all the way back to Adam Rishon of Chet of, Hadat of, Tovera. Of, of, so the Achdut, the unity that the world yearns for, is so desperately in need during the time, these trying times. In the time of Mashiach, we're going to need to be united. It happens to be the Jew's secret. Because while the whole world can be upside down as Jews, if we will be united, no harm will come upon us. We will be protected. And not only will we be protected, but we'll actually be able to achieve the true purpose of creation. Just like Hashem intended it for it to be in the beginning of time, as Jews, if we're able as Jews to be connected, to have achdut, will serve the true purpose of the whole creation of this world. Emulating Hashem and His oneness. Emulating God and His achdut. God is one, God is one, and His name is one. In other words, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. Listen, O Israel, Hashem, our God, Hashem is one. Everything is about unity. Everything is about oneness. And if we can achieve that as a nation, nothing can harm us. Nothing. Nobody can touch us. I said this also many times in my classes. I'll repeat it again. I remember that one time I saw uh, uh, an imam giving a sermon, their Friday sermon. You know, I was sitting there. I would say maybe maybe a good 10,000 or 20,000 Arabs all sitting on carpets and all these megaphones. And you're standing there. He says, when the Jews are united, do not touch them. Their God is going to protect them. We will lose. But when they're divided, fight, fight, fight. When they're divided, we can win. I mean, the guy on Friday afternoon, that's what he's preaching to the Arabs. They know that when we have Vahdud, nobody can touch us. But when we're divided, we lose. That's why the, there's so much politics, so much division. And I'm said, big, big challenge for our time right now in Kvitat de Mashiach to be united as a nation. But as the world continues, not just in Am Yisrael, not just in the land of Israel, but all over the world, the division of classes, races, the division of ideology, the tolerance, this division does not help the Geula because we're right in the midst of it. Ahdut brings protection. Ahdut brings the Geula speedily and peacefully. So what's the practical side for Ahdut, in other words, you gave me the formula for Teshuvah. You gave me the formula for Emuna. What's the formula for Ahdut? Well, we have to look past the Sephardic. We have to look past the Ashkenazic, the Chabad, the Breslev, the secular, the affiliated, unaffiliated. We all have to connect to that godly spark in every Jew. That's what's going to bring the Geula. And it's going to bring the Geula the way we wish for it, not the way that we fear it. The time of Mashiach is not about who is more religious than who. Hashem, we spoke about it in the previous class. Mashiach is not coming for the ultra-religious. And he's not coming for the Rishayim. He's coming for the Benonim. He's coming for the in-betweeners. He's coming for those ones that are struggling. 
they're struggling between their Goyish life and their Jewish life. They're struggling performing Torah Mitzvot and Masim Tovim, and they're struggling because they're emulating a lot of the Goyish ways of their life. They're in between, they're torn. But this is not the time to judge. If the guy is Jewish, if the guy has that godly spark in him, love him for who he is, unite with him, help him, talk to him, see what you could do for one another. Unity. You know, I want to read something to you in regards to what we just learned. I was surprised when I found it. it said, I believe this is uh, the Hafez Chaim brings it. He says, just because, only because of the power of Emunah, we will re- be able to achieve unity. With the power of Emunah, we will reach unity, and loving one another, meaning, you know, just loving another Jew just because he's a Jew. Loving him, not because he's Sephardic, Ashkenaz, Breslev, Chabad, keeps, doesn't keep, tattoos, bald head, peot, strimal, it doesn't matter. You're a Jew, come. We're all together. We're all part of the same team. That's the hadud that we're looking for in the end of days. Look what he says over here. I'll read it off to you. It's very, very beautiful, the way that the rabbi put it. He says that Yosef HaTzadik was a true example of Avat Chinam. What's Avat Chinam? That you uh, love somebody uh, without expecting anything in return. Unconditional love. How do we see that? We see that in the story of his brothers, that his brothers uh, threw him in a pit, sold him to the Ishmaelim. Uh, you know, they, they, they plotted as if he was killed. And Basso, in the end, when they came to Egypt to collect all the food, did Yosef seek revenge? Did Yosef yell at them? Did he tell them anything? Did he tell them off? Nothing. Gemalam Yosef Tova. Yosef actually told them that there's, there's, there's no bad blood between them. And he's not only that, he never spoke to his father about it the entire time that, his, that, that Yaakov was with Mitzrayim. So we know when Yaakov came back from, uh, came to visit Yosef in Mitzrayim for the 17 years, it says that Yosef in a way also avoided his father. Why? Just so his father won't ask him questions about what happened on that specific day. So he won't speak about his brothers. And not only that, that he would not cause any sort of uneasiness or discomfort in the family or the family uh, uh, relations. says over here. And why did he do that? Why did he not uh, seek revenge on his brothers? And why did he not want to speak to his uh, father about it or complain about it in any way or even speak about it? It says because of the strength of of his emunah. Yosef had a very, very strong belief, a very strong faith in HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Why? It says over there, he says when he first uh, revealed himself to his brothers and they tried to apologize to him about the fact that they sent him to Egypt, you know what Yosef's answer was? You didn't send me here. You guys didn't send me to Egypt. What are you thinking? Because of you I'm here? Hashem sent me. It's all from Hashem. It have Yosef, Yosef at Sadiq had emuna that everything that he went through, the pit, being sold as a slave, uh, uh, being a, a, a butler to Potiphar, the trial of Potiphar's wife, being in jail for 12 years, 10 plus 2, he never said anything about it. It's exactly what was supposed to happen. Yosef at Sadiq accepted it for what it was. No. Okay, he, he, he pinned his entire uh, story according to Ashgacha Pratit from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We see here, the rabbi continues to say that we have to really, really concentrate on Sinat Chinam, meaning the way that we hate one another for no good reason. Uh, senseless hatred. 
you know, when we just hate somebody because of their skin color or because they're not uh, Sephardic or they're not Ashkenazic or, or, or they're from this sect or from that sect. And each one has a different thing. You know, we, we were, there's a lot of Jews that are practicing the religion and the, we became sectarian. You know, everybody has their, their way of worshiping Hashem. But to work together, we don't have that. In other words, we have a lot of Torah in the world, but we don't have a lot of Torah with Ahdut. And that's a big problem because that's not a complete Torah. Torah tells us, it teaches us unity. So to have Torah and not have unity sort of cancels it out. So it says over here that we have to strengthen ourselves in the Sinat Chinam. Because of, because, because of Sinat Chinam, senseless hatred, that's why the first, uh, the second Bet HaMikdash got destroyed. It's the way that it's written, written in the Gemara, that the first Bet HaMikdash was destroyed because of Avodah Zarah, idolatry, ayot, proper relations, or uh, promiscu uh, promiscuity, Vishvichudami, murder. But the second Bet HaMikdash, Bavon Sinat Chinam, senseless hatred. And they said, even though the, the time of the second Bet HaMikdash, they had Torah and Gemilut Hasadim. They had Torah and they had Gemilut Hasadim between one another. How is it? How is it that they that that, uh, that Bet HaMikdash got uh, destroyed? The Gemara says, says that the first Bet HaMikdash got built, I'm sorry, the second Bet HaMikdash got built after 70 years. But the second one, after the second, the destruction of the second Bet HaMikdash, we've been in exile without Bet HaMikdash for over 2,000 years. Why? He says, because the Sinat Chinam is worse than Avod Azara, worse than Gilur Arayot, worse than Shvichud Dabib, and we still haven't gotten it right. In other words, Bet HaMikdash got destroyed because of senseless hatred between one another, and it hasn't gotten built because of that still. So the Hafez Chaim comes and he tells us in conclusion, Yitzbonen, look closely, learn, understand. If in the power of Sinat Chenam, we were able to uh, destroy Bet HaMikdash, and also it's preventing us from building Bet HaMikdash, he says, the three things that are going to allow us to build the third Bet HaMikdash is Emuna, Ahdut, Faith, Unity, and he says he also sticks in there, Brit, protection of the, uh, uh, of the Brit, which is a huge thing and nowadays as well. We will merit to the final redemption. So we see over here that what's on the menu, on the daily menu for us in this day and age that we're in, it's very simple. Teshuvah, get your head straight with Hashem, with the people, with His children. After Teshuvah, you have to work on your emunah. We gave the, we gave the, the details of how to work on the emunah, accepting everything, shakol tova. And after you're done with, with, with having your Teshuvah and your, uh, and your emunah, Go out there and start to unite. Start to unite with Ami Sayed. Start with your family. Start with your friends. Start with your community. Start with strangers. Reach out to that other person that's in front of you that is completely different from you, but he's a Jew. He's got a godly spark in him. What do you need? How can I help you? How can we get there? How can we be united? How can we connect? I'm not saying to bring every single person into your house and be uh, you know, an extremist, but you know, the division is, hasn't worked for us and is not going to work for us. Teshuvah, emuna Achdut, repeat. Teshuvah, emuna Achdut, repeat. Teshuvah, emuna Achdut, repeat. It's, it's just like a workout. Just like when you go to the gym to build your muscles, you got to take in all these classes to work out. You have to work out your emunah muscle. You have to work out your teshuvah muscle. You have to work out your ahdut muscle. The, the same way when you go to the gym and, you know, day after day, week after week, month after month, you see results. That's how you have to work every single day on your teshuvah. That's how you have to work every single day on your ahdut. That's how you have to work every single day on your emunah.
It's just like a muscle. You have to work on it in order for it to, first of all, be active and for, for it to work. If you just have it as a passing thought and think it's going to come up and you'll be able to activate it, it's very difficult. You have to keep it in the front of your mind that you're concentrating on Teshuvah, that you're concentrating on having Evuna, and you're concentrating on having Achdut. It's in the front of your mind to do it every day. And the results, when you put in the work, just like when you put in work in the gym, you get muscles and you get a toned body, similarly is with Teshuvah, with Evuna, and with Achdut. You'll get results, and the results will be that you are mentally and spiritually prepared for the future for the change in the world, for the redemption from Mashiach. Just like the Rachal told us, it's going to be challenging times. The time is going to be, you have to prepare yourself. And you have to pass, all you have to do is pass this quote-unquote challenge, to pass this challenge of, uh, of the times of Mashiach. And should you pass this challenge, you merit to a thousand years of bliss, a thousand years of peace, with no evil inclination, and all our ancestors living together in peace, a Torah life with the third Bet HaMikdash, and Hashem is our true king ruling over us. As it says in the Sefer Tehilim, on Perik, uh, the 126th chapter, it says, Az Yimales Chokpinu. Then that day we're going to be happy, our, our mouths will be filled with laughter, and our, our tongues will be filled with with song to Kadosh Baruch Hu. As Goyim, and then all the Gentiles are gonna say, Higdir Hashem Nasotiman, Hashem wa Hashem did a huge thing with this nation. Because the final Geula is going to uh, uh, it's going to eclipse the first Geula. You know how we still talk about wow Hashem's ten plagues, how did he control bloody waters, the 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 fire and, 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 and ice from the sky, uh, darkness, the splitting of the sea. Oh my God, till today we're talking about it. The final Geula is going to dwarf the first Geula. It's going to, we're not even going to talk about it. Great things are coming upon us. However, you have to be ready for it. Is that the Shem that we have the mental strength, that we have the desire, and we have the resilience to prepare ourselves for the Geula, to do the Teshuva, to build our Emuna, to activate Ahdut. So like that, when everything starts to go haywire around us, we're still going to be focused. We're still going to be on point. We're still going to be able to, to, to surpass this challenge. And not only that, but be able to help all the people around us and have more people merit to us. Even the, the deceased will be able to merit from our performance and not just try to wing the Geula. Because anyone who's trying to wing the Geula, what's going to happen is the Yetzirah has got your number. He's going to keep you so busy with all these different stories and plots and subplots that are going on in this world. You need to know that that's going on, but you also have your whole uh, spiritual side to you that you have to keep in, mo in, in mind in order to merit the times of Mashiach. Have a great rest of the week and a Shabbat Shalom.